Perfect. Just to make sure I'm never the Let's start. Okay, thank you for coming. It's uh, our biggest crowd in the <laughs> Okay, so today it's uh, Fabrice Kosowski, who is a postdoc in, in the group, who's going to present his work. So his current work with us is the side work, side projects, and previous work from a year. Yeah. He let us know. So uh, just like quickly, so Fabrice has done his uh, Babel in Brazil as well. Now you're Barbati for three years. Yeah, in total three years, sounds good. Total three years. And uh, since uh, almost a year now, he's, uh, he's in Toulouse, more or less. That's been some time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so today he's going to present us Two, two things about one about excited states and the other one of breaking any molecules with electrons. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you, Chito. Thank you all for being here, either physically or virtually. I'm happy to be back to the lab. And uh, so, Chito already introduced myself. So, um, I have two topics for you today, two exciting topics. The first one, concerning excited states, how to target excited states with a couple of cluster methods. And the other one is, uh, I'll talk about uh, some things I did in my previous postdoc and uh, that I've been doing in side projects, which concern breaking molecules with uh, low energy electrons. So those are the two topics that I'll cover today. So first part, excited states with per couple cluster. So uh, usually when people 
uh, target excited states uh, based on a couple cluster, they rely on the equation of motion formalism or linear response theory, uh, in which we solve first for the ground states. And then from there, you, you use equation of motion and you and you uh, build your your effective Hamiltonian, you, you solve it your CI, in your CI space, and you have your solutions based on equation of motion. It's a well-defined method with, with uh, well-defined algorithms. It's pretty black box. Uh, it's already an established approach, and usually it serves as a benchmark for accurate excitation areas. But of course, it has some cons. So in particular, it's biased towards the ground state, uh, since you start with a ground state reference. And uh, usually, it requires higher order excitations if you want very accurate uh, energies. So you can go singles and doubles, and then you have UM CSSD. But then depending on the accuracy you, you need, you, you want, you have to go to higher orders. And of course, this is the usual approach of, uh, for going for excited states, but you can also do something different. And more and more people have been doing looking at this strategy, which is uh, instead of uh, uh, like solving first for a ground state and then building a formalism for the excited states, you start already from the ground state formalism couple cluster. And then you try to look for higher uh, higher roots of the polynomial equations that define the couple cluster method. Right, so you usually solve for the for the lowest line root, which represents the ground state, but you can try to aim for uh, uh, other roots which might represent excited states. So with that, we hope that it's a more balanced uh, in the sense of uh, recovering correlation energy in a more balanced way for ground and excited states. And, and we spoke a cheaper description than going here. Uh, but of course, the con here is that uh, it demands much more care from, from, from the user from, uh, in, in each particular application. So it depends a lot on the choice of reference. You have to be careful on how you build a reference. Because now you need a, a reference for excited states. You might have unphysical solutions. So nothing guarantees you that these higher solutions that you find will actually be genuine excited states. And you also have to take care about the, uh, the, algorithms, the algorithms themselves. How do you uh, find these excited states in the first place? Uh, so we, we started uh, looking at the second approach with a version of couple cluster, which is called pair couple cluster, uh, pair, pair couple cluster doubles, which essentially you include in your excitation operator all excitations, well, double and paired excitation. So you keep all, uh, all all your configurations are cold shell. You perform all the double excitations that that pair the electrons. And um, why is that uh, version interesting? Uh, it has several nice features. So, for instance, when it compares with the OCI, which is the equivalent in, in configuration interaction, you, you spend the same space, but then you uh, solve your problem via CI uh, method. Uh, it, it's it it matches very well for ground state energies. So ground state energies are pretty close. Uh, despite the fact that uh, first CD has a polynomial scaling and CO has a much higher exponential scaling. And uh, in particular, it has a good job recovering static correlation. And usually people talk about uh, addition by subtraction. By, by subtracting some of the terms in first CD with respect to full CCSD, uh, you might recover static correlation in a more balanced way. And, and of, uh, of course, if you look at double excited states, a minimal couple cluster model will be exactly that, the first, first couple cluster. So we started uh, working with that. And uh, the four or three key questions we're trying to address here are, so first, how, how do you target excited states with per couple cluster? And for that, we worked with a simple helium atom system. And the second question is, uh, how per CCD and the OCI compare for excited states? So we, we see that you have a good matching for ground state energies, but how about excited states? Uh, so for that, we, we probe the stretching of linear H for molecule. And um, uh, we also asked the, whether PERSCD can describe the excited states without having to resort to equation of motion formalism. And connected to these two questions, uh, what do you optimize the orbitals for each state in particular? So instead of building your reference from ground state orbitals, you could try to optimize these orbitals at the correlated level for each state. So that's where this OO stands from, orbital optimization. And then the delta is because you're doing a state-specific approach. So you solve your problem for one state, you do the same for 
for the other one. And then from the energy differences, you have the oxidation energy. So uh, how does uh, this comparison and this performance of the method improve my new goal, state-specific orbit optimization? And we're waiting for the acceptance of the fit, hopefully. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Is everything that you said until now valid for any symmetry representation? Yes. Is there a symmetry? No, actually, no, because I mean, it depends on the, on, on the specific case because you are constraining your excitation in, in, paired, in, a, in the paired double with manifolds. So you, you're not breaking spatial symmetry. If you're using spatially symmetric orbitals, you're not breaking it by doing this kind, this kind of approach. You're always pairing the, the, the electrons. So it will, it will be only the totally symmetric representation. So just a few words about pairs and CD. So you do the usual uh, couple of certain sets, uh, but now the excitation operator involves double excitation with, within the same orbital Q, and then you project it in, on, on your on the reference and your excitation configurations, and that just solve a uh, couple of uh, polynomial equations. So you have an equation for the energy, and then a set of K, which is basically the number of orbit, the, the number of occupied times the number of virtu virtual orbitals. You have just solve the set. Of coupled uh, polynomial equations for your t amplitudes, right? And then uh, you, you, you can do the same for the uh, de excitation operator. So you have to introduce this because you have to express your energy as an, ex as an expectation value. And then you have the same kind of a coupled uh, k coupled equations for the z de excitation amplitudes. And then you, you do this because once you uh, optimize with respect to z, you have back the t amplitudes. And the same way around, the same way for uh, when you optimize with, with respect to T, you have this, this set of equation. Okay, now looking at helium atom. Um, so in, in a small basis set. So this would be a, a, a plot of the residual with respect to the T amplitude. So we are, we're, we're looking at zeros of your polynomial equations, right? So this would represent your ground state, and this would represent your double, double excited state. And with the usual algorithms people use uh, for solving couple cluster, you will you will access this state. So you can think of this in terms of a, um, a minimization problem or a, a stationary problem. So you, you only find this kind of state, not excited, not excited one, because you don't use information about the curvature curvature of these polynomial equations. So by doing this, by analyzing this kind of simple problem, we can see where the problem lies when you're trying to uh, target excited states. And, and here, the, uh, for the orbital op optimization, so we have only one uh, kappa, which is one orbital rotation parameter, which mix the occupied and, and the virtual orbitals, one s and one s like, a two s like orbitals of helium. So, uh, so of course, when, when you when you optimize it, a two electron system, so by optimizing the orbitals, uh, you have essentially the full full set result. And the, and the point here is that you, you have a good reference only around zero, which is your ground state reference, and around 90 when you when you swap the two orbitals, and now your, now your reference is good from the unoccupied orbital. Uh, okay, but this is a simple problem just to illustrate the, I mean, what kind of information on the curvatures you need to access this kind of excited states. But in general, of course, you have a set of coupled uh, equations. And, and, and in order to solve them, we use a Newton Hobson algorithm with the date amplitudes based on information of the Jacobian. And usually people use a, a, a constant diagonal approximation based on the difference of the uh, orbital energies. And that works fine for, for uh, ground state energies. But uh, uh, the point is, for, uh, when you aim for the excited states, you need some extra information about the Jacobian. You need the information about the curvature. And if you actually compute it, you have all this extra terms which are lost uh, uh, when, when, when you aim for the, excite, for the ground state, but you have to include that when you go for the excited state. You have this dependence of the Jacobian with the, with the actual uh, amplitudes. And this doesn't represent so much an extra cost in terms of memory, uh, of time, but a little bit of memory, but it's very doable for the uh, systems we're looking here. So yep. Or is if your connection is unstable, maybe you can switch up your video. Switch on. Doing what, sorry? Switch up your video. 
Pode durar. Yeah. Ah, ok, ok. That might help. Yeah. Okay, now for the orbital optimization part, um, we introduce this usual orbital uh, rotation exponentiation with respect to kappa, which rotates among all your unique orbitals, and then introduce them uh, on the left and right of the Hamiltonian, and you have a way of expressing your, your energy as a function of this orbital rotation parameters. And then we have to optimize that uh, with respect to kappa, and we do it here in Newton Hobson. So there's a way of uh, um, numerically solving this problem for the orbital rotation. So we optimize the orbitals for uh, a given level of theory defined by, by p and, and h. Uh, there's some, some nuances here that due to the fact that you're going for the excited state, so you have to be very careful on the algorithm, but uh, I'll skip on that. So basically how we run orbital optimization per couple clusters. So we solve for the uh, couple cluster amplitudes. Uh, once we solve for that, we build up one issue electron uh, reduced density matrices. From that, we can express gradients and hessians for the orbital rotations. We solve the, uh, the next step on our orbital space. You build a new, you build this, the, the, a new set of uh, uh, orbitals based on this rotation, which defines a new reference, and you do it again. Now you solve the couple cluster amplitudes again, and you do this iteratively until you uh, converge to a stationary point in the orbital space. And uh, yeah, so quantum package, of course, you are aware of the method is being developed here by the group in Deleuze. So I have a, this is implemented in a plugin of quantum package, uh, both the pair couple cluster and the orbital optimization protocol. Now going for H4. So here we're trying to address the comparison between pair couple cluster and, and the OCR. So I'm, I'm so this is linear H4 in a small basis set, and I'm symmetrically stretching the molecule. Uh, so I have here ground state several doubly, doubly excited states, and this last one would be a quadruply excited state. So marks here would be the OCI results with hydrofoc orbitals, and the, the dashed ones would be uh, uh, Paris CD uh, uh, results, with again the, the same hydrofoc orbitals. So you see the good matching for Yvonne state that I mentioned before, but not so much for the excited states. So this is the first result we see. They don't match any longer when you go for excited states. You also have these physical solutions here is two solutions appearing and very bad performance for the quadruple excited state for, for hydro fog orbitals. Now, if you optimize uh, for each state in particular individually, that's what you have. So now you build a reference from a set of optimized orbitals for each state. And from the, uh, this set of orbitals, we solve for example, cluster and we solve the OCI, and you have this excellent uh, match. So the, the, the problem is the bad reference that you have uh, for, for targeting excited states. You have to optimize the orbitals specifically for each state, and then, and then you have the. Uh, and again, uh, just a comparison of the two, you see a massive improvement, in particular for the uh, quadruply excited state. You see that this higher order excitations would be lacking when you have a poor reference, and they're not so important when you have a better reference, because then now you have already a better orbital relaxation of, of the excited states, which was lacking before. Uh, here, just, just to compare uh, the massive improvement you have. So this is the energy difference from uh, the two methods with the uh, hydrofoc orbitals, the dashed ones, and full lines for the spe state-specific um, orbitals. And yeah, so just to stress that the, you have a massive improvement when you optimized orbitals. And now the third point is, what about larger molecules? How does the method uh, behave and perform when you go for a larger molecule? So we study slightly larger molecules, realistic ones, and uh, sold for orbital optimization, uh, per CCD and a couple of other UM variants. So here I have some excitation energy, so for 
uh, let's say here for, for CH plus, we have this presence to do with canonical ground state hyperparticles. It's, it's, it's off. Uh, are way off, but once you optimize in, individually for ground state, exciting state, you bring that stationary much, much closer to agreement with the UM. So I went for it slightly larger again, but I have the same, a very, very uh, good agreement between the model we propose and another UM approaches. So one, one nice uh, thing that we see, the, the, the picture, the, the profile of these articles, so we don't constrain, we, do, we don't put any constraints in terms of symmetry of our for orbital optimization. So in the end, what you see is that you, you, you pay a little price on the symmetry in order to recover more of the correlation energy. So the orbitals tend to localize like this. So those on the top row would be the uh, optimized orbitals for your ground state and on the bottom row for the excited state. And you see that they usually uh, localize like this and, and, and break the symmetry. So here we are breaking this uh, plane of symmetry. And in this case, you're, you know, breaking the planar plane of symmetry here. But once you take a look at all your contributions, all your densities, you can see that uh, in the end, what you have is an excitation from a long pair orbital of the oxygen to a pi star orbital here. So, and, and, and when back again to, to the benchmarks that we have, we see Uh, overall, I mean, in, in terms of root mean square error and, and maximum absolute error, it's pretty much comparable with the UN density, much better than density. So we can say that uh, it's comparable with going up, up to triples in, in, in UN and better, better than density. And, uh, and also another thing, if you look, if you look at the signed error, this is, this is quite interesting. It's much, uh, it's really below uh, UN. And this is uh, because you are describing ground and excited state in a more balanced way. You're looking at them at, at the same, at the same with, uh, with the same formalism. So you're not introducing any bias for the ground state. So in, con in contrast to the case of UM, which you usually approach the exact value from above when you go higher in excitation degree, here you, you don't see this, so you you'd expect uh, a better recovery of correlation energy. And of course, so this would be a an alternative method, method for tar targeting double excited states, which is uh, computationally much, much cheaper than going UM CCSDP. Uh, so in summary, so those are the four questions that, that I put in the beginning. Uh, so perhaps one of the key messages here is that higher level solutions can uh, represent genuine excited states. You don't have to uh, rely on UM, for, for instance, for finding them. Uh, but then, how do you how, how do you target it? It's, uh, so you need tailored, uh, appropriate algorithms for that. And uh, so the comparison between PCD and the OCI is, is pretty nice. As soon as you, as long as you provide a state-specific reference for for each state, uh, and the same way for the performance against the UM, for instance, for double excited states. It performs pretty well, but you have to do orbit optimization in order to, to see that. So, so that, uh, again, so with the with the hot, hot, hot ground state orbitals, uh, the performance is, is very poor, but orbit optimization is critical in, in improving on that. Uh, so, some open questions we we can ask ourselves. So, uh, if you notice, there is, there were some points in which the curves stopped. So do we have issues on the convergence, so what's the deal? So perhaps the algorithm is not working in some cases, perhaps the orbitals want to go complex and they're not allowing them to, to go complex. Perhaps it's a failure of PSSD itself. It simply doesn't have a, a, a solution at certain regimes. Um, and again, uh, what if you go for larger basis set or larger molecules, would the performance remain the same, get worse, get better? Uh, how can we generalize to Target single excited states or say top of other symmetries, and actually the question. Uh, because this, of course, you are, you are constraining this totally symmetric representation of doubly excited states. Uh, another thing that we, we are seeing with Antoine and Chitou right now is uh, how, how do all this discussion uh, improve or change when you go to a variational 
description of the couple cluster instead of doing the usual projective way. Uh, and what if instead of optimizing at the correlated level, which is, I mean, perhaps an overshot, perhaps an overkill, we might want to uh, update them in a, in a mean, mean field theory, doing like more maximum arbitrary method uh, for each state specific and then doing your correlation uh, method on top of that. So what about this option? And also uh, strongly correlated case, of course, there was some stretching, but you might um, have even more strongly correlated systems close to avoid crossings or conical intersections. And all this, this two previous sketches in, in particular we are looking at right now. Uh, so that's it for the first part. So I'd like to talk a little bit about another topic, uh, which is how do you break the molecules with, with electrons? And here we're talking low energy electrons, of course. If you bombard it with a very high energy electron, anything can happen. But uh, in the low energy regime, uh, which is the more interesting one, more challenging, uh, me, uh, here low energy, I'm talking electrons with energies below 10 electron volts, typically, which is the order of energy of, of the kinetic energy of your valence electrons. So it's all about a much more complex, complicated system to, to, to explore. Okay, so this is a word in itself. It's, it's a very broad, broad area. So in general, low energy electrons, you can have many so-called channels. So you have a free electron, which impacts a molecule. And in the synthetic re region, after it interacts, you can have like elastic scattering, in which you don't transfer energy to the molecule. You can have excitation, you can uh, excite it vibrationally, electronically, you can ionize, you can associate. Uh, you can have many, many interesting things uh, happening. And uh, at particular impact energies, we can have the formation of uh, so-called transient anions. So basically, the electron is captured by the molecule, form this uh, metastable stable state, which is uh, unstable with respect to the detachment of this electron. So this is, this is one way in which this transient anion may decay. So the electron may be captured after some time it is uh, uh, ejected. Uh, else, uh, uh, alternatively, it can be decay by what we call dissociative electron attachment. So it is captured long enough to induce some dynamics and then you uh, dissociate your molecule. And this takes place uh, resonantly. So at specific energies in which the electron can be captured by the effective potential of, of the molecule, you can form this species which uh, decays by either way. And from the theory side, there's a key distinction here, which is you can't solve this with usual bound state quantum chemistry techniques, uh, because this is an unbound, a free problem. So you have to resort on either adapted quantum chemistry methodologies or, 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 or approach the problem from a scattering point of view. And you, should, you solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, with a boundary state, uh, boundary condition. So basically, you specify the energy. So when you solve a certain equation, usually for in quantum chemistry, you, you have your Newtonian and you solve for psi and E. But here we solve for, we choose also E, and you solve for psi for each E, right? Uh, in many respects. Uh, so, so very interesting and then and, and, and open problem in many, many uh, regards. So and what, uh, besides the more theoretical uh, methodological point of view, why studying uh, this kind of process? Well, for many, many, re many reasons. Uh, so uh, electrons can collide, interact with the molecules and give rise to interesting chemistry in many, many environments. So for instance, in DNA, uh, so you have an amazing radiation entering your body and it uh, generates lots of secondary species among them attached to specific sites and the long-term damage, biological damage. And nowadays it's more or less believed that a lot of the damage we see uh, on DNA caused by ionizing radiation stems from low energy electrons. It's not clear by how much, but low energy electrons can damage DNA 
So it's important to understand how does that take place. And also interstellar media. So the, the astrochemistry uh, of interstellar media in a huge part might also uh, have a huge component of low energy electrons, which might attach to molecules in this association. So the chemical evolution of prebiotic molecules a lot uh, a topic that's that's growing a lot so people are trying to see what's the role of low energy electrons in inducing this kind of uh, reactions in, in space so uh, seeing so-called uh, thermal plasmas which which are basically uh, uh, well, a species uh, a system which you have free electrons again uh, so the, there, are, there are ideas for example of uh, uh, exploring raw uh, material from, from the production of ethanol and sugar um, in, order, in order to better make use of material that would, would, which would typically be discarded, that is a very uh, sugar rich material which could be exposed to plasmas. And uh, then again, low energy electrons might attach and break the bonds you have to break in order to re release this sugar free uh, material. Um, so another more, more, more recent uh, idea is to use what's called a fabid, uh, focused electron beam induced dissociation. Uh, so you, you have an organometallic molecule, you have a, a high energy beam of electrons, and they, then you can uh, do several uh, dissociation, uh, excitation, and other processes, and eventually the central metal can be deposited in a very controlled, spatially controlled way. And modeling, understanding what's going on, again, requires understanding what electrons do in these environments. And many, many other applications. So just to give an, an idea of why uh, collision of electrons with molecules is important. Uh, so uh, we've been using uh, a method which is called the Schwinger multi-channel method, which was developed in the 80s uh, for, for studying this, this problem. So it's an ab initial formulation for studying uh, the scattering of low energy electrons and positrons from molecules. And it, it's uh, a fixed nuclear approximation. So uh, we can at the moment describe uh, uh, the competition between elastic and electronic excitation channels. And with some uh, adiabatic approximations, we could in principle do vibration or association. But at the moment, uh, that's it. And then there, there's some it's a homemade code, uh, which more recently I've been involved in, in, in developing, uh, both in terms of uh, performance and, and models, actual scattering models for this kind of system. So there's lots and lots of room for, for exploring this method scattering methodologies based on better uh, quantum chemistry uh, techniques. And uh, so I'd like to um, talk a little bit about this, this method that we, myself and Mario, we proposed uh, last year and uh, last two years, which, um, which concerned the dynamics of these transient anions. So we, uh, these transient anions are, are key for understanding the role of uh, uh, low energy electrons. So usually what people did for uh, studying the dynamics of these states was to build uh, potential energy surfaces with the very costly um, scattering methodologies usually and uh, uh, restrained for, with very, very few uh, degrees of freedom because of this cost of building the potential energy surface. So here I'm talking about maximum three degrees of freedom. Of course, this is very accurate, but uh, you cannot go uh, so you you build up, you do, you do quantum dynamics on that. But you can't do that for large molecules or, or, or more degrees of freedom. So what we did was, uh, I mean, in a sense, was what people started doing in the 90s for excitation, uh, photo excitation of chemistry, but for transient amounts, or, or, or more generally for transient states. So uh, doing instead of building up the potential energy, doing, doing this on the fly, with all degrees of freedom and a more approximate uh, way to describing the, the nuclei classically instead of quantum mechanically. And uh, okay, the, the, the 
challenge. The key challenge here was to why you accounting that your population doesn't sum up to one. You lose population, but you discoupling to some continuum. Um, so that is right. So uh, in, in the beginning, we want to do this for the specific case of transatomic ions, but then we notice that this problem is much more general, and the method developed could be of much more uh, broad interest. So in general, we have uh, several methods for the dynamics, quantum uh, classical dynamics, quantum dynamics, but not so much for states as I said, who lose, lose norms. So you have a transient state which uh, whose population decreases because of this coupling to a, to a continuum. So what we did was uh, a generalization of trajectory surface hopping, which is a method uh, largely used for probing chemistry, uh, uh, relaxation of excited molecules and, and assemblies. So we generalize it for the case of complex valid potentials. Right? And uh, so very, very briefly, what is this uh, generalization about? So in, in the end of the day, you have one a set of equation of motion for your electronic degrees of freedom. Uh, so those C's are your coefficients for each electronic, adiabatic electronic state. You have at each uh, uh, configuration, set of configuration uh, VR. Uh, so you, you, you propagate this in time. So you have a phase with the energy of your state. Then you have a, a decay term, which accounts for this loss of population. And then you have the couplings between each pair of state where the population is transferred from one state to another. So you're going to have the usual diabatic and non-adiabatic couplings, and eventually some coupling via the shared continuum. So that's another way the states can be coupled, coupled in, in this case. So this is how you propagated the electronic because of freedom, and nuclear are propagated classically for each. Um, I mean, the, uh, so so, so they, are, they are in one given uh, adiabatic state J. And then the coupling between uh, light and, and heavy particles takes place via fuel, fuel switch. So basically, you propagate a, an ensemble of classical trajectories, which represent your quantum wave packet uh, in, in individually. And then uh, for each one, uh, the electronic states are coupled uh, via this equation. And then based on the populations, you can you define which state is, uh, is guiding your nuclear. And then in the end, you do statistics, statistics on that, and you expect that you have observables that you would have by doing proper quantum analysis. Uh, so this is just uh, so this is a, 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 an analytical model that we first studied. Um, so 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 we have here, for instance, we started in in the, in the black curve. So we have a Gaussian here, and then we uh, we set the clock when let's say this is uh, excited or promoted to either red or blue curves which are coupled in either a more strongly coupled regime or a more weakly coupled regimes uh the other way around in terms of that but and uh, and then we and then oh, this would be the real adiabatic, adiabatic potential and then imaginary uh, adiabatic potential which accounts for the, for the decay. And then we propagate wave packet, either the wave packet quantum mechanically or via our methods classically on these potential surfaces in both the real and imaginary parts. And then and this is the, uh, how the populations evolve in time, basically. So we see, we can, we, we can describe very, very well uh, the final populations and even this nice, this, this finer, some, some finer features, second order features here. So we are confident that we are able to describe uh, with, with this um, generalized trajectory surface swapping both the decay and the couplings between, between the states. And then we you know, as a very, very first application, we looked at the case of uh, Yodo thing. And why is that? Well, uh, it's a very small molecule. So in principle, we could do higher level calculations for that. And even though it's small, it is expected to have typical DEA, dissociative electron attachment mechanisms that you might find also in larger, more interesting, relevant molecules, such as 
how we view SUs, which are uh, some of them used as a radio sensitizer in, in, in chemo radiation therapy are, are pollutants. So basically you have, you have some unsaturated parts and some uh, heavy allergen and you uh, expect to understand the DNA mechanisms of these small molecules, which might be interesting for understanding how it takes place in larger ones. So the only thing we have for the system is concerning electron collisions. Uh, I'll give an experiment from the eight is in which they, they see two uh, resonances, two, two transient anions, a sigma star and a phi star. And the other kind of experiment in which you measure the ion use as a function of your electron impact energy. So you have these resonances give rise to abstraction of the, your iodine anion. Uh, so this is what you know, but what are the underlying mechanisms? How do you start from here and end up here for this particular case, yeah, more generally? Uh, so for that, we have to devise a, 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 the implementation of the method and for this particular application, a model that combines different uh, strategies, different methodologies. So I'll go quickly on, on this part, but basically, uh, the resonance energy themselves, you compute with the term RCI, which is a systematic shift to correct for the lack of uh, higher line correlation uh, in order to match separate scattering calculations with our, with our code. And, uh, and then the resonance with, with this, perhaps the hardest part. So I had to combine a model uh, with the on the fly energies computed along the dynamics and very few uh, costly, well selected. Scattering calculations, and then the non battery dynamics with the with the other method. So very uh, quickly here. So this would be the result of one single scattering calculation at the equilibrium. The neutral equilibrium geometry, and then you have this uh, cross section. So this is a signature of your sigma star resonance. So basically the electron 0.5 EV of impact energy. It's not for the pi star orbital. So this is uh, the scattering population. This, the width that provides information about the lifetime of this of these things. Right? So it's quickly, it's very short uh, lifetime uh, compared very well with the experiment in terms of the position of these resonances. But this is only one geometry. So we have to, um, so these are details for the dynamics. So skip that. And uh, so the, here lies, the, uh, let's say, the complicated part in which we uh, have to devise a model for the width. So basically, we uh, looked at the, the, the energies and the width along the CI stretching and along the CC stretching for both states. And then, and then we, I mean, we, 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 I mean, build a, a functional form for uh, the gamma one of the lower state as a function of the CI stretching, and then I'm gonna choose for the, for the CC stretching, and then we cross-checked for the other case, and it works fine. And so in the end, we have this, so this would be a, a model for, with very, very few, so each point here, each pair of points represents one scattering calculation. And based on this model, we, we extrapolate, or extrapolated and interpolated from the resonance energies that are computed on the fly. Uh, so in the end, we, we have, results for the population, how the population behaves in time, or how the uh, population of the lower line state and the upper line state behave as a function of time. So you can see that it's ultra, ultra fast. So we start up with, with a population of one. So here we're starting in the sigma star resonance, so the lower line state. So the decay is really, really fast. So below uh, 10 frames per second, you lose 80% of your population, and it eventually converges around 0.2, and you, uh, you, you, you don't populate the upper state. So we start on the sigma. What you have is that you stretch your CI bone very quickly and you always stay on the lower surface. So it's a, a very direct mechanism. You populate the sigma star uh, anti-bonding orbital at the CI bone and you, and, you, and you break it in a very uh, short time scale. Now, if you start with the pi star resonance, now that's more Interesting. So you started with the red one. So you started decaying. So again, this decay 
uh, is related to the fact that the lesson is being ejected to the continuum. But if it survives for, let's say, five seconds or so, now you have this transfer of population from the pi star to the sigma star orbital. So you start stretching the CC, you put your le lesson there, there. The system relaxes by stretching. And at a given point, then you start to transferring population from one stage to the other. And after you transfer a big chunk, chunk of your population, now you start to Uh, stretch the CI bond, and the lesson sits on the pi star. It's transferred to the, to the and, then you, and then you cleavage. And also, I mean, as a side note, we, we have this interesting barrier here. So basically, the, both the neutral and the anion states energies are going up, but one is going up faster than the other. I mean, the neutral faster than the anion. So in this case, this didn't um, quench the reaction, but it might be the case that uh, depending on, on the Files it might quench direction in another case, and, and we can also compute. Uh, so this is one of the key observables: uh, cross sections, DEA cross sections for direction. So this will be the experiment that I showed you before, which unfortunately is not uh, in absolute units. So I have to normalize to the peak. So this is a contribution from the sigma star, the contribution for, from the pi star. We can compute it, and we see a nice matching. On the overall profile of the curve, so it's a uh, direction that would be like this. Just as I said, you dissociate, otherwise, you can populate this state, which couples to the other one, it stretches and, and, and associates. And by doing so, you also lose norm. Notice that the, 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 the height of your Gaussian here is lower because you are also detaching the electron while you propagate. And uh, so uh, we, we have implemented this in Newton X, which is a code for doing dynamics of uh, electronically of uh, exciting states, also computing uh, spectra, it interfaces with several quantum chemistry programs. So in principle, the next release, this method should be available for the community. And as I said, so our motivation here was to study dynamics of transient anions. And we noticed that could be more general. So in principle, this methodology could also be used for any kind of so super excited states, which are state are excited for nice states. For fluorescence, for instance. Uh, you, you can, in principle, model it with some imaginary component which describes the, the, the loss of population due to the uh, radiative decay. So, in principle, you can describe it in a, in a, with, within the one the magical dynamics in, a, in the same footing. And uh, other types of continuum, you can think of molecules on surfaces, on, on cavities, which is a very hot topic nowadays, or in external electric fields, which introduce some kind of uh, loss of population be one mechanism or, or another. And uh, so, so the summary of this second part, uh, so one of the important message here is uh, chemistry with electrons, electron reactions take place via transient negative anions, in which you, the, cap, the electron is captured, survives for long enough, the state survives for long enough to induce dynamics in those reactions. So describing the states, describing its dynamics is essential. And uh, we developed uh, a new methodology for doing uh, not the bad dynamics of, of the same states. Uh, so, in principle, it could describe any kind of uh, alternating states and all sorts of uh, other processes. And as a first application, we studied DEA to IO dating uh, and start providing some picture of the underlying dynamics that might be of, uh, might provide insights for how it takes place on, on larger molecules as well. And now here's some open problems with respect to electron induced reactions. So I mean, there is a need of combining ideas and expertise from different 
area of background for, for, for you know, providing a better description about a first description of this kind of process. So we have to know quantum chemistry, you have to uh, be aware of that this is a scattering problem, so you can have loss of population. And of course, you have to do dynamics at different levels. So how do you combine all of these tools in order to uh, have a picture of what's going on? And in particular, I didn't talk here, perhaps another day, about uh, the scattering models themselves. So there's a huge need Improving on the electronic station part, uh, which is key for all sorts of, of uh, potential applications. Uh, so, we're starting start to provide with this sort of uh, 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 the process of, of several chemically relevant uh, processes. And with that, I conclude some acknowledgments, especially RC. Uh, I thank you all for, for being here. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? Oh, so we start with one I think it was the fastest. Regarding the first part of your talk, uh, there is another question. Why, why to limit yourself? to the closed shell double excitation. Once you have done a single reference couple cluster, you may express the correlation energy as a sum of contribution of all the various double excitation. Then, if you take a, a, a CI space, a excited, a excited determinant, for instance, single, or singles, you may address the matrix, the diagonal matrix element of your CIS by all the effects of the double excitation, which remain possible on the excited determinant, okay, without repeating, without staying in the model space in your work, CI space you are working with. This we have done with uh, an exact SEPA formalism, and the results were absolutely excellent. And, but we never did the combination with double cluster, which is the standard of which would be much better. And um, I suggest that we do that because it's very inexpensive and uh, very simple to, to, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, thank you. Because it's more democratic and you put a lot of much more physics and analyzer to push that double. So you dress the, the broken pair. You address each determinant for the CIS, for instance, yeah. by the part of the correlation energy which you may repeat on that determinant. Right. But some of the double excitations are impossible. And you might have, uh, you may use this in very flexible manner for the select the CI yeah. with, the, with the, the condition that the double excitation which you want to repeat on the, on the given determinant. Uh, must send you out of the CI space you are working on. Okay? In order to avoid this repetition. Thank you. Uh, just a very, very final question. First, um, so you have your method there in the second part complex surface, the surface, the surface, the surface. Yeah. You, you abbreviate it CSFSSH. Yeah, it's a big acronym. Sorry? It's a big no, acronym. The trajectory is the trajectory. F S. I don't see that. No, that, that's for few switch surface hopping actually. So the few switch okay. surface hopping is a version of trajectory surface hopping margin. Okay. So so yeah. Okay. Um, the, 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 the technical class um, and the first part. So you, you showed for the helium atom, you showed that you have this ground state and the solid state, which is the S one squared to S squared. Uh, and you said that the normal couple cluster, you will always end up with the first one. <clears throat> In principle, I would say uh, you don't have to. The point is that the couple cluster equations are nonlinear, multiple solutions. So if you always start off with the N2, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. But I mean, if I plug in the uh, basically by hand the expectation to two squared, I, I, I cannot see that. My yeah, absolutely. Would take me down to the ground. So I need to use that converge nicely to the 
Yeah, absolutely. But then again, that that depends on essentially on the algorithm, because here for let's say, so you're saying okay, if I start with the t amplitude very close to the excited state, so we should convert to the excited state. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah, if you take if you properly account for the curvature of your Jacobian of of your residual. Otherwise, now you're now you're um, I have to say now you're, you're referring to a Newton Raphson uh, kind of approach, but I mean in the normal yeah. couple plus you just uh, you just iterate. Yeah, but it, in, in your iteration, you effectively use the energy differences of your orbital energies for an approximation of the Hessian. So you do a kind of Newton Raphson. Uh, without actually taking care of the of the curvature, so we tried this at the beginning, using usual way of iterating the equations. So basically, if if you start here, you go up and you converge. If you start in either region with the positive residue, you go down and you converge. And if you start from here, you diverge. So this is this is an unstable cell point, uh, an unstable stationary point, for your uh, typical way of of solving it. So if you give the exact amplitudes for the excited states, it will deviate from it by updating your your by, by solving iteratively in the usual. So so that's one of the key messages we have to use tailored algorithms for that. because for the wrong state the, the derivatives of the residuals with respect to each of the amplitudes is always positive. So you can use a quasi Newton way of of, of getting there, but that's not the case for the excited state. So you need information about the curvatures uh, close to this, to this region. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you you mentioned that you had uh, physical solution. How do you distinguish between the physical and the unphysical solution? That's that's an excellent question. <laughs> I mean, we we don't we can we cannot make be sure that. Like, okay, this one is physical, this one is unphysical, unless we have a reference. As we have full set results that tell you how many at which energies we are to expect to see when we give a solution. So we, we, we can. We... And you showed some for H4, I think you used. Yeah, for example, so usually we have a very nice comparison between the two sets of results, so we know they're all physical. Unless in this region here, for example, you you, you have a you have a branching point, so here you have real energies, then you have a, a, a branching point. Ah, there are two different. Yeah, and then you have two solutions. So which one is physical? Uh, Between the two, it's difficult to say which one. Is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty much mm, very, very equivalent in terms of the amplitudes. So it's hard to tell, okay, this one is physical, this one is not. And then also here, actually, you, you can have, you, you have a branching point, and then here I'm showing only the real, uh, the real part of the, the energy. You also have an imaginary component here, so you can have uh, uh, solutions with uh, complex dilute energies. And does it the sign that it's unphysical? If it's an energy, it should be real, right? For the exact uh, for the exact theory, yes. But uh, for a couple clusters, you can have in principle uh, complex energy uh, solutions because your 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 Hamiltonian is no is no longer Hermitian. So by doing the similar transformation, you lose the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian, and you can have complex Sure, sure, but you can have solution. I mean, you have a, a, the equation that you solve, you give you a solution, and then you can see which constraints that the solution have to satisfy to be physical. So yes, yeah, that, that's the way. I mean, we, we, we do this all the time with the spin, spin projection, for instance. It has to be an eigenvalue of, of a square, but depending on the methodology, it is or it is not. Or it, it has to respect point group symmetry, and here, for instance, we see that it, it may not. If we, I mean, it's always this, this trade-off you have between energy and some other property that you have to know it has to comply with. It's it's in, 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 a, in a sense it's it's the same here. Like it, it can go complex, and uh, that's the price you pay for. I mean, in this case, not because now the, the energy is become complex, so it will have to then define no, no longer a, a difference from. The, um, Just in the other cases, they are all purely real, or they also have complex parts. No, in this part they are real. So in this branching point, two real solutions merge into a pair of complex uh, conjugate uh, yeah. solutions. Yeah. And, and, and the other ones where you don't have uh, this uh, stepping the branching. No, thing, actually, what, one of here, I think the purple one, there is also some uh, branching point here, but okay. other, otherwise, and you see that this is uh, 
in physical, but this is an artifact because we are using hydrophobic uh, arbitrals. Once you optimize again, I mean, not only energies match much better, but you, you, you get rid of all these physical or, or dubious solutions, which you cannot make sure which one is which. So this is an artifact from the fact that you're using bad references for describing an excited state. So, no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it happens here because the model is not good enough for very low energy. At very low energy, for instance, you have you may have rotation, excitation, which you have to take into account. Otherwise, like in, in a in a fixed nuclear approximation, diverge. The, the differential cross-section diverges at at the forward direction, and that's because you are not properly taking into account rotation, excitation of the molecule. So that's a deficiency of the model, the scattering model we have. So inevitably you have this because you're missing some part in physics. But uh, for, I mean, this is only become relevant at very, very low energies. And, and, and we, we know that this doesn't impact at all the energies we're probing here. So you cannot determine the scattering of the No. No, with this methodology, no. I mean, we, we can, I mean, we can give a number, but I wouldn't trust this one. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank you again, Fabrice. Who's recording? Who's